Good morning. Well, it's a pleasure to be back at the Consensus Conference here in New York. Uh, my name is Garrick Heilman. I'm at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. I also have a research position at the London School of Economics. I'm the founder of MacroDigest.com, which is a Google News for macroeconomics, if you will. And I'm very proud to have uh, created uh, and to produce still the State of Bitcoin and Blockchain reports. This is our 10th report. Uh, we started this in early 2014. And this is a snapshot of what's going to be coming out uh, here in the next few days online. So you'll get a copy of all these slides online if you're worried about the speed at which I'm going to go through these. Um, so let's go ahead and pull up the report. OK. So I'm going to try to cover four things. First, I want to provide a general industry overview. So we think of the whole industry, cryptocurrency and blockchain, together in these reports. I want to talk briefly about the state of Bitcoin, which is arguably still uh, blockchain technology's killer app in terms of what's been widely deployed to date. Talk about Ethereum briefly, and then go into the state of blockchain. So first, we'll start with an industry overview. Oops. Let's go back. Great. So $1.1 billion has been raised to date uh, by cryptocurrency and blockchain startups. That's a really, really significant number. Um, the other point that's interesting with Q1 especially is that we saw a reversal of the trend. There have been a declining level of investment in the industry over the last several quarters, both in terms of overall fund flow and average deal size. This really changed in Q1 with the emergence of blockchain as a distinct investment category. What makes this result even more impressive is that it actually has happened uh, amidst an overall slowdown, uh, a continued slowdown, if you will, in the overall venture capital uh, environment, which continues to soften. So I'm going to spend a couple uh, of a little longer on this slide because this is really important to understanding how we actually analyze the space and how we segment the space. And I spoke a little bit about this in September at the last consensus conference. We think of kind of three different categories of companies when we actually do our analysis. So what we call Bitcoin companies or currency companies are ones that focus on some type of currency activity. So you can think of a Bitcoin company as one that's involved with payments and cross-border remittances, as exchange trading, as any other type of currency company. That's one classification of companies, all right? We distinguish that from blockchain companies, which are involved in what we call non-currency applications. So everything from security settlement to asset providence to identity management uh, to property title. You know, these are, in many cases, still financial assets, but they're not currency uh, transactions in the same way that the currency companies focus on, you know, currency-type transactions. And then, of course, we have what we call hybrid companies. ITBIT, which is based here in New York, I think is a good example of this. They started as a currency company with their exchange platform and now moved into providing uh, a blockchain solution. So they do a bit of both. And if you run the numbers with this uh, segmentation, uh, you can see about 40% of the total 1.1 billion that's been raised has gone to blockchain and hybrid startups to date, up from 36% at the end of Q4. So it's interesting to note that still less than half of the total investment in the area is in blockchain. Uh, Q1, for the first time ever, blockchain investment exceeded Bitcoin investment, so exceeded investment going into currency companies by a pretty dramatic margin. 84% of the total investment in Q1 went into blockchain startups. This is really clear evidence that we moved beyond hype and, and we are now in kind of the kind of implementation and investment phase. Uh, people are walking the talk in terms of backing blockchain initiatives. So I'm gonna briefly say a few words about Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's had a pretty interesting last uh, few months. It's had a pretty interesting morning, I might add. Uh, this is one of these kind of things you dread as a presenter. Uh, you've, you've done some work on your slides and then all of a sudden your phone's ringing in the morning. It's some television show that wants you on about some news that just broke. But, uh, you know, Bitcoin is, is kind of this, you know, economic, uh, minor economic miracle. And a lot of people want to dismiss it and say, it's, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's old news. But it really has defied economic theory. Uh, millions of people are not supposed to get up and actually move to an alternative currency that isn't backed by a central bank, that isn't... Uh, something you can use to pay your taxes. So it isn't, it isn't something you want to dismiss too, too lightly. Um, and Bitcoin's had some positives over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, its market capitalization is up 2x, so it's doubled in value. Uh, the number of ATMs that have been deployed have doubled. 
and the hashing rate, so the, the computing power which underpins the network, has actually tripled in the last 12 months. Um, now, Bitcoin's price has been relatively stable. It's actually had one of its least volatile quarters in, in Q1. Now, this is not necessarily a good thing, actually. Um, many people have argued, oh, we just need to wait till Bitcoin becomes more stable and then people adopt it. Maybe down the road that's true, but right now, I would argue that volatility is actually a positive thing for Bitcoin. It attracts traders, which increases liquidity. It attracts media interest. Uh, lower volatility is no panacea for Bitcoin. Now, something really unusual also occurred with Bitcoin trading this quarter. Uh, the exchange trading volume spiked. This doesn't typically happen when volatility is low. Usually when volatility is low, trading is low. Now, there's been a lot of doubt expressed about the accuracy of these self-reported exchange, exchange trading volume figures. So take these numbers with a grain of salt, but it's still an interesting data point nevertheless. How has Bitcoin performed against other currencies and asset classes this year? Eh, I mean, it's up, but it certainly has underperformed a lot of other leading currencies and, and other commodities like silver and gold. So it's had a bit of a kind of a, a mediocre start to 2016, I would say. Uh, and this is probably largely responsible to kind of the mixed forces that are weighing on Bitcoin. Negative drivers include, obviously, the scaling debate, which I'm sure many people are familiar with, the emergence of alternatives like Ethereum, which we'll talk more about here in just a moment. And on a more positive note, in July of this year, the mining reward is going to get cut from 25 Bitcoins down to 12 and a half, and that's going to complete create a supply constraint, and that should obviously be a boost. So uh, a series of mixed forces, I think, are kind of combining to kind of keep Bitcoin you know, roughly where it is in, in terms of its value. The final comment I want to say about Bitcoin, especially here in New York, is with regards to the regulatory environment. So only one company to date has been approved for a bit license, Circle, and many, many others are waiting to hear on their applications. The regulatory cloud over the cryptocurrency space more generally is still, I think, a big issue around cryptocurrency use. Uh, in Europe, there's concerns around the use of cryptocurrencies related to threat financing. And this could all have implications for not just Bitcoin, but Ethereum and others, other public currencies uh, uh, that, that uh, you know, are part of kind of the blockchain world. Okay, so let's move on to Ethereum. So traditionally, the altcoin space is kind of the category that we kind of dumped Ethereum into, and it's been a pretty small space. Uh, it's been, if you take a look at the total market capitalization of all 600 cryptocurrencies out there, Bitcoin has traditionally represented over 90% of that. Well, that changed this last quarter with really the rise of Ethereum. Not just Ethereum, too. Other, other cryptocurrencies also had pretty good quarters, but Ethereum had the best by far. Uh, Ethereum was up over 1,300% uh, against Bitcoin's price, so huge huge spike in value. Um, and, and as often as the case, uh, Google search interest is, is highly correlated with price spikes. Uh, and you see that. You see Ethereum actually rising in the, in the search rankings uh, against other blockchain and Bitcoin terms. Um, so what's so special about Ethereum? Well, there's a lot of things we're going to hear about over the next couple days. Let me just briefly mention one thing, which is that smart contracts run natively on the Ethereum platform. So what are smart contracts? Well, they're, in many people's minds, the kind of killer app of blockchain technology. Um, I'm a dog owner, so I like to use the example of a dog to explain smart contracts. Briefly, uh, imagine you have a dog, uh, Walker, who comes and picks up Fido, your dog. Fido has a GPS chip on its neck. Dog Walker walks the dog around the agreed upon route. And at the end of that, the chip sends a signal to the network uh, commanding the smart contract to issue an automatic payment to your dog Walker. That's kind of, in essence, how a smart contract works. It's a form of automation, basically. And it's something that's native to Ethereum. So the final slide I want to make about Ethereum, and again, this is the slide that I was kind of worried about uh, about 5 AM this morning when I woke up. <laughs> I'm going to still leave a question mark up there for now, personally. But um, so this is a really interesting issue, right? Uh, open source movements, governance, and innovation. Um, for the last year, I'm sure many of you know, the Bitcoin world's been embroiled in a big debate about scaling the, uh, the protocol. Um, Ethereum, in contrast, hasn't had nearly the kind of gridlock or anything like that kind of gridlock. And you know, if you look at Linux historically, Linus was always there to really kind of settle disputes. And so I think it raises a really interesting question around the importance of founders 
with regards to both governance and innovation. And it's interesting uh, that Craig Wright, not only coming out today, uh, you know, kind of announcing that, you know, or he's, he's Satoshi, has also come out with a very strong position on the scaling argument actually arguing that, uh, you know, basically we should scale Bitcoin up dramatically and taking uh, shots at some of the critics of that, that approach. Um, so this is something to watch, uh, you know, in terms of the, the importance of founders to innovation and governance. Okay, so let's move on to the state of blockchain. Um, so three things I'm going to cover here quickly. First, sentiment, and then taxonomy and conceptual framework, and then also uh, we'll talk a little bit about investment and biz dev before wrapping up. So the sentiment around blockchain has obviously uh, you know, gotten pretty significant. You can see this when you run word cloud analysis of articles. Blockchain is now the dominant term used in the media space, whereas last year Bitcoin still dominated. Um, another really important point to make, I think, here in New York is that interest in blockchain is, is massive over in Asia. If you look at some of the Asian media sources, uh, you know, there's tremendous interest there, and that's going to have a huge uh, impact on how this technology progresses. Um, the other thing that's important to highlight is the number of announcements are still continuing to grow from traditional financial institutions. So this just tracks which firms are out there announcing some kind of new blockchain initiative. Uh, rather than tailing off, it actually accelerated in Q1. So the taxonomy, taxonomy and conceptual framework, this is again important for kind of understanding how we approach the blockchain sector and how we kind of slice the pie up and analyze things. Um, so we you know, have kind of remar you know, noticed how blockchain technology is kind of this interesting Rorschach test, has a Rorschach test effect kind of on people. Some people look at blockchain technology and they see this open source, public, permissionless system, whereas other people look at it and see something very, very different. They see, you know, a permission, private, more closed type system. Uh, this is really one of the most powerful things about blockchain technology, its ability to be different things to different people. So we want to distinguish between blockchain technology and the blockchain, okay? So what is the difference? Blockchain technology is a more generic term that's kind of akin to what Oracle or companies like IBM do when they sell databases into companies, all right? The blockchain can refer to something like Bitcoin's blockchain or Ethereum's blockchain, so that's one distinction we should make. A second distinction, and we don't have time to go through this uh, slide in too much depth, is between public and private blockchains, of course. Now here in New York, where a lot of financial institutions are based, it's very important and easy to understand why there's so much interest in private or permissioned blockchains. Uh, having the ability to reverse transactions is a powerful feature that you know, traditional financial firms want. Having more control over who can participate in the network, having faster speed and throughput. These are all features of private blockchains, one of the strengths they offer over public blockchains. The final conceptual framework point I want to make, and I, because I heard there were a lot of people from Deloitte here, I knew I had to put in a two by two matrix slide, right? So. Um, is we can further distinguish between, you know, not just public and private blockchains, but also platforms and software. So platforms, you can think of as companies like Facebook, as iOS. These are, you know, software protocols that people can build on, right? Other developers can come in through open APIs, et cetera, and build things on. Software, again, is more like when Oracle sells a database into a company to be used in a more limited way. Um, so examples of public platforms are Ethereum and Bitcoin. Private platforms would be Ripple and Blockstream. Uh, the reason why this two by two matrix is useful is because it allows us to observe areas of concentration. So where are we seeing a lot of activity in the blockchain space? And the two most crowded quadrants are the public platform quadrant and the lower right quadrant, the private software quadrant. So in the lower right, uh, you have companies like you know, Digital Asset Holdings, Chain, uh, R3 is an interesting example, based here in New York, of you know, a company or an organization that might you know, be in the process of transitioning to become a platform, but may also offer more tailored software solutions. I think the jury is still out on whether some of these firms will want to or actually be able to become platforms, but it could have very important implications for the development of the space. So finally, just to wrap up on investment and business development. Um, so the total number of blockchain VC deals in Q1, uh, there were two times as many as there were currency deals. Uh, there is four times as many blockchain startups today as there were one year ago. These are some of the highlights in the blockchain space. If you look at geographic dispersion of where blockchain investment is occurring, the US continues to dominate, of course. Uh, 
But other areas which are attracting a lot of blockchain investment are UK, Israel, Sweden, Germany, and then Argentina, interestingly, is the one developing country that is attracting a significant amount of blockchain investment. But we're seeing a similar pattern as we saw with Bitcoin investment emerge, where it's the advanced countries that are attracting the, the most investment. The other point I want to make is that R3 was certainly first, uh, I think, to build a very large consortium. But one interesting thing is that has not seemed to have a very negative impact on the ability of other blockchain initiatives to attract a wide range of partners. So Hyperledger, formerly called the Open Ledger Project, now has 40 members. Uh, Microsoft has continued to make progress with their Azure platform. Uh, Swift recently made an announcement. In other words, being first hasn't ne necessarily led to kind of a lock on the space. And I would say the, the, the environment is very fluid still uh, in the blockchain world. So the final, final point I want to make is I want to leave you with a question. As we've moved from kind of hype to implementation and execution in the blockchain world, this really important question has emerged around timing. So two and a half years ago, Mark Andreessen, the venture capitalist, penned a widely referenced piece in the New York Times about how this area reminded him of where the internet was in 1993. So two and a half years ago, this space resembled in the 1993 internet. And from 1993, we know that it was only a few short years until we saw world-beating Web 1.0 companies like Cisco emerge. All right? Are we, the question I'm leaving you with this, and this is what I hope we can, we can get a better sense of at this conference, is are we closer to that view of the world that we're only a few years off or a short time away from the emergence of blockchain technology uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in scale and wide adoption? Or are we closer to a 10-year time horizon? Morgan Stanley recently wrote a report suggesting it's the latter. But I think this is a really important question. That billion dollars in venture capital that's been invested is not, it, it's predicated on an adoption life cycle that's going to happen quicker than 10 years. Um, so, Anyway, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to uh, chatting with you throughout the conference. Thank you.